You are an extraordinary dad. Let me tell you why. It's the love you continually pour out. It's the time you devote to train up and teach your children in the ways of the Lord. It's the selfless example you set as you lay your life down for the ones you love. It's the way you paint an earthly picture of the way our Heavenly Father loves. With strokes of patience, kindness, forgiveness, truth, mercy, and compassion. It's legacy that will reach generations far beyond your lifetime. Sometimes, it's not biological. It can be the one who chose to step in and step up when someone else didn't. Sometimes, it's the spiritual father figure who stood in the place where no one else was. It can be the man who rises to the occasion of being the godly example someone else needed. To every man who has fulfilled the role of a father figure, we honor you, we appreciate you, we thank you, we love you. Happy Father's Day. Gratitude, thanks for them. And we do celebrate and honor you, both those of you who are here with us, those of you who are watching, but even, even those who have gone before us. We need spiritually minded, engaged, involved fathers who are shining light in a dark world. We need this, and we are grateful for you. We're celebrating you today. And if you're a father, if you're a mentor, if you're a grandfather, if you're a relational father to someone else who just needs that, you're a spiritual father to them, we just want you to know how needed you are, how important this is. You know, supposedly Father's Day was first celebrated back in 1910, and it was celebrated whenever Sonoa Smart wanted to honor her father who had invested himself in their family. Her mom had died when she was 16 years of age, and there were five kids that her father had raised. He was an American Civil War veteran raising five kids, and she just really wanted to see fathers honored and celebrated, and she kind of was the one that initiated all of this and got it going. And how many of you think that father that she wanted to honor felt like he was a little in over his head, you know, in that moment. And of course he was. But I think every father feels that way. I think there is something about the challenge and the complexities of what it means to be a father that, yes, there's some natural pathways of maturity that happen through that and a dependence of, on God that is needed from that. But I also believe that today it's common for men to feel unprepared for some of these challenges. And I think part of it can be because perhaps it wasn't modeled for you. Maybe you were in a situation where your father was not able to provide that kind of an example for you. Uh, maybe he felt, felt ill-prepared for that as well. Maybe he was unaware of the guidance that you needed or desired. Perhaps his skill set wasn't there because of dealing with his own wounds or trauma or brokenness that each and every one of us have as well and can at times struggle with. And I think sometimes that might be the reason why, but I also think for a lot of fathers today, for a lot of men today, it is complicated also by just the culture that we are living in right now. There's some added complexities to this. We live in a culture that has some, some obvious attacks on the distinction between men and women. There are disagreements, even what constitutes a man or a woman. There's, there's talk of toxic masculinity, which yes, that exists, but also at the same time, it seems oftentimes there's an attempt to get rid of masculinity altogether. We, we live in a society that's complicated this. Bethke and Tyson, in their book, Fighting Shadows, say as a result of this, for a lot of men, they either tend to overcompensate, and they do that through aggression or defiance, or they shut down by just staying out of it altogether, even if they have thoughts on something or feelings on something because they don't, they don't want to just find themselves in another pointless fight. Or they medicate. And they medicate to distract from the frustrations and the disappointments that they face. And that can show up in a lot of ways through escapism, which happens when they're just spending all their time, whether it's in, in gaming or hobbies or sports 
whether it's in drugs or alcohol or pornography, all of these things can do that. Men can tend to drift into the shadows when wrestling with all of these things. But here's what I want to say to all of our men and to our dads on Father's Day today, and it's this. It's that God is calling you out of the darkness into the light. That God wants to use you as light in a dark world, and he is calling to you into the light. In fact, that's who our Father is. In James chapter 117, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down to us from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Our Father is a Father of lights. In Him, there is no darkness at all. There's no sin. There's no transgression. Everything in Him, light is exemplified in our Father, our Heavenly Father. That means integrity, loyalty, honor, glory, wisdom, the fruit of the Spirit, even the physical lights of moon, stars, and sun. Everything is created. It is for His glory. It is for His purpose. As the Father of lights, He embodies everything that is good, everything that is right. It's who He is, and that's who He's calling us to be, to come into the light of who He is. Every man, every father, step into the light of who our Father is. Our community needs you, Our community needs your gifts, they need your energy, they need your service, they need your sacrifice, they need it needs your spirit, your light, it needs you. And so we just want to honor you and celebrate for you and pray for you today. So I just want to pray right now. And Heavenly Father, we we are grateful, God, that you are a Father who loves us, who lavishes your love upon us, that you are a father who is good in every way, who gives good gifts to your children, that you're a father who sets the example for us, but even more than that, you are the father of lights, that, Lord, everything good and right and true, it is found in you. And, Father, we thank you that, God, you not only set the example, that you not only pour out your spirit into our lives to fill us with what we need, you are the one who models for us what healthy fatherhood can look like. And I just want to pray for every person here today that we're honoring and that we're celebrating, that your spirit would lead them and direct them and point them to who Jesus is so that they can shine that light in this world. And we thank you for them in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Well, this is my first Father's Day. That's a little different. It's a little different for me because three of my four kids are, like, not here. Uh, This is a little different for us. Um, One of them is, for at least the next three months, is in Washington. Uh, One of my children is in Phoenix, Arizona, and is moving there, in fact, closing on a house tomorrow, and then in about a week and a half, Kim and I are going to be going to help them move in and do some work on their new house and move them there to Phoenix, Arizona, so they're not here. Uh, One of my children is in northern Missouri uh, as we speak, and so is not here. So only one child out of four loves her father, only one. (laughs) And that's my bad dad joke for uh, Father's Day, but but this really is a different season for Kim and I as our kids are out of the house and, and growing up in these ways. In fact, uh, here recently, uh, my youngest son's bedroom, we actually moved to a different spot, and that bedroom is now uh, my wife's office and scrapbook room. It's like a she cave. It's what happened. And it, so we've been doing some work in there, working on that. But one of the first things we did to start that transformation wasn't just moving the things out but it was taking out these curtains. And these curtains were put up when my son was five years of age. We remodeled that room uh, to make it his, and she had bought these curtains, which were thermal blackout curtains. So they're the ones that block out all the light, but they also were supposed to help block out the heat from this very large picture window that was right there in that room. And so we were taking those down, but I remember when we were putting those up, and when we were putting them up, my my son, that first night when I was putting him to bed, uh, wanted me to crack him open just a little bit. He's five years old. He wanted a little bit of light to come into the room. And I remember at times when we would check on him before we went to bed, you know, every, every once in a while, he, he would ask if we could just crack the door open a little bit 
Because he just wanted, he didn't want to hear the conversations that were going on out there. That was boring. He wanted the light to come into the darkness. And every once in a while when I would go to bed, I would kind of peek in there to see how, you know, he was resting or sleeping. And I noticed the closet light was on because he wanted light in the darkness. You know, spiritually speaking, and even more than that, when it comes to every part of who you are, you were born for the light. You were born for the light. This is how God created you. And the problem is sin brought that blackout curtain of darkness into your life. And it didn't just come in the world out there. Like, it's not just dark out there in the world. This is the bad news. Is It's dark in here. That darkness starts in here and then even makes its way in and through our world. We are facing darkness all around us. And that is the tragedy. It's not just that it's around us, but it's within us. But the good news is that light is available for all who would receive it. That there is a way out of the darkness, through the darkness, to where you can see something beautiful if you would receive it. It reminds me of Rose Crawford, a story I read about years ago, who at the time of this photograph had been blind for 50 years. For 50 years, she saw no light. For 50 years, no color, no beauty. She was just living in darkness for 50 years of her life until she heard that she was a candidate for a surgery that could fix the blindness. And she had an operation in a hospital. It was in Ontario, Canada. And when they took the bandages off her eyes, she just began to weep and weep because she suddenly had a world opened up to her of dazzling beauty, a world that was hard for her to picture or imagine. For so much of her life, she had just lived in this place of darkness, but now she could see light. And not just light, but this nurse in this picture was showing her and teaching her colors. And she was using this beautiful array of flowers. And of course, the picture's in black and white. I know it's ironic. But uh, it was showing her, I guess I didn't have color photography at that moment, but uh, it was a beautiful array of, of flowers so she could learn her colors as Rose began to see the beauty that was all around her. So much joy in a story like this. But also in Rose's story, there's also, I think, an element of sadness to it as well because what the doctor then talked about is that for over 20-some years, she was a candidate for this surgery. They, they already knew about this surgery, that it could have helped her, but she didn't know about the surgery. And so for literally almost half of her life, she lived in darkness unnecessarily. She didn't need to live in darkness. And the doctor said it this way, The one who performed the operation said she just figured there was nothing that could be done about her condition and she accepted the darkness. She assumed this is just the way it is. This is the way life is. This is just the way her world is. Sadly, I think there's a lot of people who have come to accept the darkness. This is just the way it is. This is just the way I'm going to be. This is just the way it has to be. They've come to accept the darkness and live in the darkness, whether it's through sin or selfishness or greed or anger or jealousy or covetousness or self-preservation or brokenness or confusion or aimlessness. That darkness has just led them into depravity, which leads you into deeper and darker darkness. And you assume there's really not a way out of this for you. But today, the good news I want to bring you on this Father's Day is that Jesus, he is your way out of darkness. Jesus is light to your darkness. He is truth to your confusion. He is the clarity to your life's direction that you need. Jesus is the way out of this. And today, I just want to shine a little bit of light. I want to illuminate what God wants to show us today on this Father's Day. Because last week we were dealing with the first of Jesus' I am statements as we go through those during this summer. We're, we're kind of following along really with what our students have been learning at camp as they too are going through some of these I am statements. And last week we talked about how Jesus is the bread of life. He's the sustainer. But today I want us to look at the second I am statement that Jesus made. It's found in John chapter 8 verse 12. And it tells us this, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, I am light. I'm the light of the world. And light biblically represents two things, holiness and truth. Truth and holiness. That is what light represents. In other words, Jesus is the light who guides you into truth, and Jesus is the light that guides you into righteous living. He is truth, and he is holy. He is the guide into all truth. He is the the one who is holy in and of himself. He is the light. He's the source of light. He's the sustainer of light. And when Jesus said this, I am the light of the world, he's making an audacious claim. And the reason for that is because of what both the Old and New Testament say about light. And it says this, God is light. When Jesus says, I am light, he is saying that he is God. And when you look Fast forward into the New Testament to 1 John, John's letter in 1 John chapter 1, John would say this. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. Heard from who? Well, prior to that, he's talking about how they touched Jesus and saw Jesus and heard Jesus. And he's talking about Jesus. Here's what we heard from Jesus. That God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. When we walk in the light, we live in truth. It is both truth and holiness. God is holy. God is true. God is light. There is no darkness in him. And we read this throughout Scripture, Psalm 27. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? At the end of the Bible, in Revelation 21, when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, and that God is going to dwell with us, it tells us there that the sun is not needed, the moon is not needed, and it says it for this reason, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The Father and the Son, God the Father and Jesus, they are the light that we need. They are the light of the kingdom of heaven. Nothing else is needed. And so when Jesus comes and he claims to be the light of the world, he's claiming to be God, to be equal with God. He's claiming to be the light of heaven. That's who he is. And John will also say the same thing in his gospel of John in the very first chapter. This is a text many of you probably recognize where in John chapter 1 verses 1 through 13, here's what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's talking about John the Baptist now. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. But his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Jesus is the true light that gives life to everyone. I want to talk just for a moment about what light is, and that's this. Light is true. Jesus is true. This is how you know it's light, because it's true. In Ephesians 4, 17 to 18, or through 19, it says, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They've lost They've lost, it says there, their sensitivity. They've given themselves over to sensuality. They're indulging in impurities. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them. In other words, without God, we do stupid things. Without God, we become darkened in our understanding. Apart from God, we are separated from the life that God has for us. And every time John uses the word life here, he uses the word zoe, it's eternal life. We're separated from that life. 
And this doesn't have to do with a lack of intelligence. It has to do with the hardening of our heart. It has to do with being deceived by the evil one and buying into his lies and believing that this is the way it has to be. We're in darkness. It's got to be this way. It happens when we allow ourselves to be accustomed to the darkness, which is what happens when you live in darkness. Your eyes start adjusting. And you become more accustomed to it and used to it. And you stop listening to the Lord and to his voice and what he's wanting you to do. In fact, you start to enjoy some of the things that are in the darkness because you're so far removed from the light. You don't even know what truth is anymore. And you begin to become ignorant and harden your heart and struggle and become darkened in your understanding. You become blinded from seeing the things of God. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, it says that unbelievers cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. It's like they're blinded from that because they've accepted the darkness, they live in the darkness, they're comfortable with the darkness, they prefer the darkness. Intellectually, light refers to truth and darkness refers to ignorance. And we become ignorant when we willfully ignore God. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 8 says, "For, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. It is God who's illuminated our hearts with the knowledge of who he is. Light is truth. It is knowledge of who God is. And we see that beauty, that light displayed perfectly in the person, in the face of Jesus Christ. He is truth. He is knowledge. He he is everything that is right. Everything that is good is found in Christ. This is what Jesus means when he says, I am the light of the world. It is a bold, audacious statement for him to make that he is light, he is God, but it's not a stretch because it's true. John says it this way in John 1. He says, in him was life, and that life was, was the light of all mankind. In him was L-I-F-E. And that L-I-F-E was the L-I-G-H-T. That life was the light. Life there is zoe, Greek. It means eternal, divine life. This isn't the short-term breath that I have right now. It's not the duration of my life. It's not just what I live for here and now. Eternal life is in Jesus because he is the light. He's the light of all mankind. In other words, light is eternal. Jesus is eternal. It's eternal life. And when you hear the word eternal, do not think old. And some people do that. They they hear eternal forever, they start thinking old. They even refer to God as the old man in the sky. You realize he's not old. He's eternal. That's very different. Eternal does not mean that God is old. God is always young. He is vibrant. He's exuberant. He is powerful. He's alive. He's forever. We grow old. God doesn't. We break down and get tired. God doesn't because we are in a broken world because of sin. But God is perfect and he is holy and he is Zoe. He is eternal life and he is offering it to us in the person of Jesus. In him we have life and he, that life was the light of all mankind. We have that life which is true light. And it shines in the darkness. And here's what John says about that. The darkness cannot overcome it. I know sometimes you can just look around and just think that the darkness is winning. Sometimes you can even look within yourself and feel like the darkness is winning. you got to know the truth. Darkness cannot overcome the light of Jesus. It cannot overcome it. There is a a story about a cave, a cave which was underground, which caves are in a habit of doing. Um, It had spent its life in darkness. And the sun called out to the cave. And the, the sun said, come up. Come up into the light. Come and see the sunshine. And the cave retorted, I don't know what sunshine means. I I don't know anything but darkness. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Finally, the cave ventured forth and was surprised to see light everywhere. Shocked, surprised. Never seen such a thing before. So then the cave said to the sun, Come with me and see the darkness. And the sun said to the cave, I've, I've never seen darkness. What is darkness? And the cave replied, come, see. And so one day the sun accepted the invitation and entered the cave. Now show me your darkness, the sun said. But there was no darkness there. So the cave said, come deeper. And so the sun went deeper and deeper into the cave. Where is the darkness, the sun said. There was no darkness there. Try coming deeper. The sun went deeper. And no darkness was found. There was no darkness anywhere. Jesus is the light that has come into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. He shines in our lives the light of life. You're called into the light. 1 Peter 2, 9. You are, and there's quite the list there, but he goes on, you're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He's called you out of darkness into the light. But tragically, John chapter 1, 11, 12 says that some did not receive. They didn't receive the light. They didn't receive Jesus. Some of them preferred the cave. They preferred the darkness. They loved the darkness more than light. They came to accept it more than the light. They just decided that's how they were going to have to live. John 3, 19 says this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Our hearts can become so callous, you can begin to prefer something, something that is far worse than that thing which is great. We can be so hardened, we prefer the darkness instead of the light because we don't like how the light makes us feel. Like in verse 20, when it says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. It's like when, when your spouse or, or a sibling or you know, a child comes into your room and it's complete darkness because you've got the blackout curtain thing going on and then they flip on the light and it's just, oh, it's painful in that moment because your eyes had grown accustomed to the dark. You became used to that. And when the light exposed it for what it was, it can almost be painful in that moment. And that's the danger of darkness. We can become more accustomed to it, familiar with it. We begin to think that that's normal. When in fact, it's taking us deeper and deeper into depravity and despair. It's not just trying to illuminate the light, we need to expose what's in the dark. John Tyson, in his book, Fighting Shadows, he quotes Carl Jung, who said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. So many Christian men today think that if we just imagine things differently, we will become better men. But the power of positive thinking hasn't worked. So much of what men have been told is nothing more than simply imagining light. You can't imagine your way into godliness or into manhood. Jung says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Until you allow what's going on deep down inside that is pulling and drawing you into darkness, until it's brought out into the open, until we make the unconscious conscious, then we're not going to experience the change that Jesus wants to make in our life. We've got to confess it. We've got to bring it into the open. We've got to let God deal with it. There's two things that are threatening right now to hold you back from keeping you from experiencing the light of Jesus in your life. And those things are fear and lethargy. Fear will do it because you're afraid of, of what this might mean or who you might become or you're afraid that you're not going to be able to do it or what others will think of you or they might think you're self-righteous or the, what the enemy might want to do. And so fear can cause you to shrink back into the darkness, into the shadows. And some are doing that. 
And lethargy will do the same thing. Lethargy just says, you don't have to do this now. You can do it later. Lethargy leads you to be into apathy or a lack of energy, a lack of vigor with God. Lethargy says, stop being so intense or so purposeful. You probably can't make a difference anyway. Lethargy will also lead you to shrink back into the shadows. Fear does it. Lethargy does it. Getting accustomed to the darkness does it. You'll be drawn back into the shadows of darkness. Lethargy says mediocrity is safe. Risk isn't worth it. But the Bible says something very different. You are not to shrink back. You're not to go into the shadows. You're not going to stay in the darkness. No, Ephesians 5.14 says, wake up, sleeper. Wake up. Rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Come out. Come out of the darkness. In John 1.12, it says, to those who believed in his name and receive eternal life, they step into the light. They come into the light of who he is. In other words, light is something that's not just true to be believed. It's something to be walked in. Light means righteous living. Righteous living. God is calling you out of the darkness into the light. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. I mean, this is serious. It doesn't say you once, you know, were like, you know, in the darkness or in a dark place. It's like you once were this. You were darkness. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We need the light of Christ to shine on us. We need him to illuminate our hearts so we can see this, because we are darkness. Whatever we, we are in, it's what we are. It's, he says, in this case, it's what you were. You were darkness. Whatever dominion we are in, we are of. We are that system. And so there's no system of evil in the world apart from the darkness of the individuals who are that system. There's no system of light in the world apart from those who are the light of the world. Either you are darkness or you are light. And Colossians 1 says that Christ He has rescued us and redeemed us from that dominion of darkness. He's brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We are in that kingdom of light by his grace. You were once darkness, but not now. You are light. You're not just surrounded by light. You are intimately identified with light because Jesus Christ, the light, lives within you. And he changes you. He transforms you. He forgives you. And he allows that light to shine throughout this world. We live in that light, which means when you're in Christ, you live righteously. You live in holiness. So intellectually, if light has to do with the knowledge, the truth, morally, light refers to holiness. In Ephesians 5.8, it says the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, truth. Like, it's holy. Morally, darkness refers to evil. That's why in Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. This, there's a battle between light and the darkness. And when we live in the light, we live in truth and we live in righteousness. As Christians, we are recognized by our lifestyle and our actions. That's why the text goes on in Ephesians to say, don't live as unwise but as wise because the days are evil. Be careful then how you live. So we want Christ to illuminate our hearts and the Holy Spirit to shine on us so that we might shine for him. And look, here's the evidence. I just want to close with this. Here's the evidence that you are walking in the light with Jesus as your guide. Here's the evidence right here. Number one, you intellectually live in truth. When you live in truth, intellectually, you are walking in the light of Jesus, and he is your source of truth. His word is your source of truth. Ephesians 4.20 says, you were taught in accordance with the truth that's in Christ Jesus. Apart from him, there is no truth. Number two, You morally live in holiness. You intellectually live in truth. You morally live in holiness. Ephesians 5.8 says the fruit of light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. And so we we walk humbly and 
holy with the Lord. Number three, you willfully seek to please the Lord. He is your aim. Not anyone else, not any person, not, not any other authority. Like, you willfully seek to please the Lord. Ephesians 5.10 went on to say, find out what pleases the Lord. Test and approve, it says, of what pleases the Lord. Like, lay out your life into the open so that the light can shine on it and reveal what is there. And in the process of bringing it into the light, as he shines his, the light of his, of, of his spirit into your heart, you will be changed, you'll be transformed, you will seek to please him. Do the light test. Let it shine on you to reveal if you're seeking to please the Lord or not, and then seek to please the Lord. And then number four is this. This is evidence that you're walking in the light. You purposely transmit his light to others. You could just say you purposely let his light shine through you. In Matthew chapter 5, it tells us there that not only is Jesus light, but when you're in Christ, you, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. If Christ is in you, he's going to shine through you. It's how it, it works. Hide it under a bushel? No. No. If Christ is in me, he's going to shine through me. There was a, a couple who took their young son with them on vacation, and they were actually going through Europe and visiting some of the infamous cathedrals that were there, seeing these beautiful structures, stained glass windows, many of them named after the saints. Uh, many of the saints depicted in those stained glass windows as they went through those cathedrals throughout Europe. The boy Sunday school teacher knew the family, knew the trip, knew what they were doing, all this stuff. So when they got back, and that Sunday, uh, that boy was in his class with his teacher who knew they'd taken this trip. The teacher asked the boy this question, and she just, she just asked him, um, you know, did you learn what a saint is? Did you learn what a saint is? And the boy started thinking about that. That word had come up a lot. Buildings named after saints. Started thinking about the, the stained glass windows with the saints in it. And here's what this young man said to his teacher. He said, a saint is a person who the light shines through. A saint is a person who the light shines through. And I think if we're to respond to Jesus, who's the light of the world, if we're to humble ourselves and come to him, allowing him to illuminate our hearts so we come to understand the truth of who he is and we walk in holiness with him, we're gonna be that person that allows the light to shine through, and shine through to a world that is desperate for the light still walking in darkness. Light has come into the world. And the world did not recognize him or receive him. But those who did, those who believed, he became the light that was the life of men. And he wants to be your life. He wants to be your light. And he wants to shine through you in significant ways. And I want you to just allow the light to shine this week. You know, I, I was thinking on this, and I remembered a story. I went back to look how long ago it was. It actually was from 2010, so then I started laughing because I was like, that's a long time ago. But as a church, we had done something that year. You know, like P90X was the big thing back then, so we did B90, which is read the whole Bible in 90 days. Some of you were there then and did that. And we read the whole Bible in 90 days. We made a whole church thing, and we did it in our life groups, the whole thing. And uh, I remember Mike Gillum was just talking about that. And he was just talking about as, they, as he and his wife were doing that, reading it 90 days, that he was just talking about how they, they had just become more in tune every day to, to see God around them and all the little things. And, and he, he told me a story about that, an example of that. Because he said that week they, they were, they'd gone to the credit union, and when they went there, pulled up in their car, they saw this couple, a man and his wife, and they were frantically looking through the grass there in front of the credit union. And he, the guy had a, a metal detector, and they were obviously looking for something. And he was like pulling up like right next to him. And uh, so he rolled down his window. He says, what are you guys looking for? And he said, my, my husband's wedding ring. 
And they'd been doing lawn care there the day before, lost the ring, had looked that afternoon, couldn't find it, got this metal detector. They were trying to find this ring, and they had no luck that morning trying to find it. It meant a lot to them, and they were going to spend some time trying to find this thing. And Mike just felt prompted by the Lord. Lord is why he wrote down his window, was uh, he was just going to pray for them. And uh, he's kind of trying to find out how he could pray for them. So he said, well, could I pray for you and just pray that God would lead you to it? And uh, the lady was like, sure, you know, and so <laughs> sitting in his car, Mike, he just started praying for them, and he just prayed that, that God would lead them right to the ring and would just provide that for them, and that through that, he would just reveal them, himself to them in a significant way. He had no idea if they were believers or not or what their story was, so he just, he just prayed for that and prayed right then and there. If it led, led to do it, got done, said amen, they said thank you, and he pulls off, but they hadn't even left yet when all of a sudden they found the ring. And they were celebrating, they found the ring. Mike and Linda, they were like, we were celebrating, I think, even more than they were. You know, just feeling prompted by God to pray for them and that God would choose in that moment just to answer their prayer in that significant way and reveal himself in, in, in a way to them. Because really, from that day forward, you know, you know they were going to tell that story again. And every time they tell that story, we looked all afternoon, couldn't find it. We got a metal detector. We're out there in the yard. We couldn't find it. Some guy pulled up in his car. So can I pray for you, you know, as you'd find your ring? And then we found the ring. It's like God gets the glory in the story because they were just sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading that, that they would just illuminate whatever situation was going on there just with the knowledge of God and his care for them and his love for them. And they would just pray for them in that moment. They, they let the light shine through. And as we leave today, I know for every father that's in here, God wants the light to shine through. I know for every person that's in here, God wants the light to shine through. I know for a lost world out there, God wants the light to shine through. And that is our prayer right now. So Lord, I just pray that we would let your light shine through. That Jesus, each and every one of us, Lord, would trust and believe in you because you are the light of life. Lord, I pray that for those in this room who have never surrendered their life to your Lordship, confessing you as Lord and Savior, believing in your name, repenting of their sins, for every person here today who's not yet been baptized into Christ in that moment of surrender, Lord, I pray that they would humbly come to you today to believe you, to trust in you, to receive you. Lord, I pray for every person here today who's grown accustomed to the darkness and been drifting back into the shadows, thinking this is the way it has to be. I pray your light comes bursting through into their soul. You would illuminate in their life what needs to change, what they need to give up and release. Lord, those areas of sin in their life that need to be confessed to you. Lord, I pray that you, there would be a revealing as you open their eyes from the blindness, from the darkness, and they could see you, Jesus, and see the beauty of who you are. And they would walk with you, walk in holiness and walk in truth. And they live in that. Lord, I pray that as we leave today, we would let the light shine through us, knowing that you are light for a dark world, and that is the hope that this world needs. Thank you, Jesus, for being the light. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as you stand to your feet as we sing, I'm going to be stepping right over here to Decision Point. And if you have a decision to make today, you'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus or take a step of faith, I'd love to meet with you there. Our prayer team is going to be on the sides of the room today. They would love to pray with you there uh, for anything that you might be experiencing going through. They'd love to pray with you there. But as we sing, let this be a moment right now where we invite the light to shine into our hearts. I'll meet you right over here.